First, I would like to say how happy I am to see such a beautiful Theravadan um, forest monastery in Australia. And um, having had ordinations here, one or more, I'm not sure, um, it means that the Dhamma has landed in Australia. And uh, I'm really, truly happy about that. The place is magnificent. I'm highly impressed. And all the monks that have had their hand uh, in this and have worked on it really need to be congratulated. And um, the other thing is I want to thank Acham Brahms for um, giving me this opportunity to um, share with you the way I've been teaching for the past 10 years. Maybe it will interest you to also hear that I myself have been doing the jhanas for much longer, but I didn't dare open my mouth and teach them because there was and still is so much um, controversy about it. And in 1983, I met the Venerable Nyanarama of Mitrigala. And, um, well, I went looking for him. And I was told that he would um, be able to confirm or otherwise whether this was correct, what I was doing. Because, obviously, I didn't have a teacher to teach me. There wasn't anybody around that was teaching the jhanas. So I met him, and he confirmed and said to me, you must teach that in the West because it's a lost art. And uh, I said, yes, I will, sir. And gently and slowly I started teaching it. I started in Sri Lanka and got a lot of uh, flack because if I'm teaching it, that means I must be doing it. Well, how else? So that went on for a while, and it uh, subsided. And then when I started teaching it in the West, of course, there were people there also who had been told that they shouldn't do it. But meanwhile that has also subsided to some extent, there's still always uh, some questions arising. And I will uh, outline those. The first thing to say about Janus, in my personal opinion, and I'm going to say personal opinion when it is the other things which I say when I don't mention that. It's not my personal opinion, it's that which is experienced. But the personal opinion is that monks and nuns have to do the jhanas. Their monk or nun life will not be satisfactory without them for the simple reason that we have to forego many of our essential desires. When there's um, no sex, No music, no movies, can't go shopping, can't eat when you want to. All what ordinary people, worldlings, put a jhanas, do. And um, we are not so other than ordinary. But when our meditation comes to the point where we are able to have this wonderful substitute. Well, that's not even well enough said. When we have the ability to gain happiness and peace within without sensual contact, then we have not only a substitute, but something far greater than we could get through our sense contacts. And I, again, believe, personal view, that when Westerners disrobe 
it's because the meditation didn't come together. And we do have that happen not so infrequently on both sides, the male and the female side. It's not a, a great tragedy in our society, but if the meditation had come together, it couldn't have happened. Because now, for instance, in this place, everything is geared towards meditating. There's absolute quiet. There are kutis. There's a beautiful sala. And the whole thing is set up so that one can actually do it and benefit from it. So that's the first point. We should do it. The second point is, in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 68, the Buddha says about the jhanas, this is a pleasure I will allow myself. That alone should be enough to dispense with all controversy. But apparently it isn't. If one reads the Majjhima Nikaya, and read those suttas which are concerned with the path and with the meditation, it's never without the jhanas. We all know that he learned them first and then realized that there has to be something beyond that, which means the jhanas are the means. They are not the end but they are the means. And in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha actually says that path and fruit can arise after any of them, even after the first one. We also know that when he sat under the famous Bodhi tree in what's today Bodh Gaya, he went to the eighth jhana, back down to the first, at the time that enlightenment occurred, and then formulated the Four Noble Truths, his enlightenment statement. We know that on his deathbed, he went through the jhanas, and the Venerable Anuruddha stated that he died between fourth and fifths. I usually say, what's good enough for the Buddha should be good enough for us. And it's essential that we have that kind of certainty that the Buddha is our teacher and that we can emulate him. Obviously, the jhanas are not enlightenment. The jhanas are mundane. They are not super mundane. But not only do they give us the way of living without having to look for sense contacts. We're going to have sense contacts anyway. But they also give us an enormously expanded horizon and a much deeper perspective. And being the means for the mind, they are that which will get us there. They are the means because we need an undisturbed and unworried and calm mind in order to see truth. The words Kanika Samadhi and Upachara Samadhi momentary concentration and excess concentration were not used by the Buddha. They are commentarial. There's nothing wrong with the commentaries, but momentary concentration is what everybody has when they even dial a phone. Momentary concentration is what everybody has when they drive a car. Otherwise, they'd kill themselves. Excess concentration is a little better than that. Excess concentration at least brings the mind to 
a state where there is some restfulness. It feels, at uh, excess concentration, upachara samadhi, feels as if one is on the breath and at the same time there are nebulous thoughts in the background which are going by the back of the head like clouds, which of course they're not, but that is what it feels like very often. If we get to that, there's more determination needed. The Buddhas talked about summer samadhi, the eighth step on the Noble Eightfold Path, right concentration. And there's no question that that's what he meant. He meant the jhanas. And if we do take a look at the explanations that we find in the, mainly in the Majjhima Nikaya, but also in the Visuddhi Magga, we can see quite clearly what is meant by the jhanas. Now, in the Visuddhi Magga, there's a very curious thing, uh, many curious things, but one is particularly curious. One third of the whole Visuddhi Magga deals with the jhanas. And then there is mentioned in it the ten corruptions of insight. And they have been misconstrued to mean that one shouldn't do the jhanas. The ten corruptions of insight contain four of the factors which are, constitute the seven factors of enlightenment. Now, when we have a look at those ten corruptions of insight, we need to have a very good look at the fact that they contain PT, which is translated as rapture, delight would be just as well. It contains the um, uh, pasadi, which is tranquility, and it contains upeka, equanimity, and it, in, it contains energy, which are four of the seven factors of enlightenment. So what has happened with those, which is another argument which is constantly being bandied about, the ten corruptions of insight, what has happened with those is they've been misunderstood. One has, so to say, tossed out the baby with the bathwater. One doesn't do the jhanas because one could get attached to them. That's another one of the ten attachment. Well, if anybody ever comes up with that argument, it's certainly being better than being attached to sensual desires, if one has to have attachments. And we're going to have attachments until we're enlightened. Nibbana is non-clinging. So that's one thing about them. But the other thing about these ten corruptions of insight is the fact that they need, they are part and parcel of the path. The only thing that one is warned about is that one shouldn't think one is at the end of the path. I've been teaching the jhanas for ten years, eleven now. I've been teaching for nineteen years. I have yet to meet a Westerner who has become uh, convinced that because of doing the jhanas, he or she is enlightened. I haven't met anyone. Or he or she is uh, cleverer than the teacher. Nothing at all. What the jhanas actually constitute are the natural way the mind goes. Meditation is science of mind. And science has to be repeatable and has to be open to everyone. And it also has to be explainable. Otherwise, it's not science. The Buddha explained it. He showed how to repeat it. He taught it so that everybody could do it. Amongst my students, Many can do it. I can't give any numbers. I, I don't count them, so I don't know. But many can, particularly the first three. 
every human mind is geared to go in that direction. And if we have any interest, which obviously we do, in the spiritual life and any yearning for transcendental experience, that's where the mind goes. It can't go anywhere else. It goes along the path of the jhanas. And very often, when I speak about them, people will afterwards say, oh, but I've been doing that. I didn't know it was the jhanas. Others will say, oh, I did that when I was six years old. Didn't know that I should do that again. If you remember, the Buddha did it when he was 12. He went to the uh, plowing festival with his father and then couldn't be found, was sitting under a tree and uh, obviously was meditating. And when he came then into the forest to his first teacher and uh, was taught the jhanas, he remembered that when he was sitting under that tree at the plowing festival, he had been doing them. This is not uncommon. Small children do them automatically, not all of them obviously, but some. And when one comes back to it in one's grown-up life, one remembers that one has actually done them. If you read the um, Christian mystics of the Middle Ages, who are most interesting, you will find that they were doing exactly the same thing. Teresa de Avila explained the jhanas as seven chambers. Well, we've got eight. And all her language was very visionary and, of course, Christian-orientated, but was exactly the same thing. Francisco de Asuna, who was a teacher, explained them more pragmatically. Meister Eckhart did them in a different terminology. This is an interesting aspect because they also got lost in Christianity. I've met quite a number of um, Carmelite nuns who are bemoaning the fact that while they're reading the instructions of Teresa de Villa, the um, interior castle instructions to her nuns, nobody tells them how to do it. We are living in a technological age and uh, the whole climate of our society is not geared towards the interior being. But there's more and more interest in it. And having put on the robes, obviously that's what we are after. When people say, and it is being said over and over again, they're not necessary. The question is, why did the Buddha do them? There's no argument about it. We also know from our own personal experience that if our meditation does not become calm and peaceful, does not bring about a different state of consciousness, we're not satisfied. We do it because it's part and parcel of the tradition. It belongs to our daily um, um, schedule, but it doesn't bring what it could bring. It's not difficult. Every human mind can do it. Every meditator can do it. Some people take longer, some can do it quicker. But everyone can do it. If the instructions are there, and they are there from the Buddha, there's no reason why one shouldn't do it. One first has to get over that hurdle of that it's unnecessary and one can have path and fruit by just noting. 
I don't know whether one can have path on food by just noting. It's a personal opinion when I say I doubt it. But as I say, it's a personal opinion, so that's worth nothing. But the jhanas are the way to have a different mind state. Now, the path moment is a mind moment but the jhanas are mind states and that's a big difference because a mind moment obviously lasts a moment but mind states imbue the mind with a different level of consciousness now this different level of consciousness has residual effect in daily life. I'm now going to outline the practicalities of the jhanas. Watching the breath is the key. We have to have a method. And the method is the key. Of course, there are other methods. If you remember... In the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, there are 40 different methods. But let's just assume we're using the breath, which most of us probably do. It's a key. Now, in order to open a door, we have to have the key in hand long enough and steady enough to stick it into the keyhole. That's what we're trying when we are trying to stay on the breath. And once more, I like to repeat, if there is excess upachara, neighborhood concentration, which one would assume there is, it needs just a little more willpower to let go and to fall into the breath. What happens when there is apana, full concentration? The breath becomes very fine. In fact, it can become so fine that one can't find it. If one is not a skilled meditator, one takes a deep breath and gets back to the key with which one has fiddled already all the time instead of letting go of the key opening the door and going over the threshold so if the breath becomes very fine it's hard to find not to take a deep breath but to drop the attention on the breath and put the attention on one's inner sensation. The inner sensation at that time is piti, the Pali piti, not the English piti. And piti is delightful sensation. Now in the scriptures we find 17 different kinds of piti. There are probably more. The most common one, common ones, Lightness of body, a feeling of floating, warmth, not heat, warmth, a tingling all through the body, a losing of the um, boundaries of the body, a totally different body feeling. Now, obviously, we don't meditate in order to get a totally different body feeling. But that's the first chamber. In order to get to the others, we have to walk through that one. That's number one. And actually, in the discourse, in the Anguttara Nikaya, which I mentioned earlier, the Buddha did say that one can get path and fruit even after the first jhana, which is not common 
because the first jhana is still a little exciting, especially if one isn't used to it. If it should happen for the first time, the response in the mind is usually, hey, what's this? And that finishes that meditation. Unfortunately, the response in the mind often is, I want it back. That doesn't work. Whatever we want in meditation doesn't work. We have to let go. But being somewhat skilled at meditation, we sit down without wanting and just concentrating. And then we will find that we can go across that threshold into our inner being and experience a totally different kind of body feeling. Now, as we sit now, the body is heavy and it has a definite outline. We know exactly where it begins and ends. And it isn't altogether pleasant either. It may be neutral, but if we paid attention to it, which we might not do at the moment because we want to pay attention to what's being said. But if we paid attention to it, we would find it isn't all that pleasant. It just is. It just is a body. But in the first jhana, it becomes a totally different kind of feeling. And as we experience that, any one of those sensations which I have mentioned or something else, which is utterly pleasant, utterly delightful. We need to stay with that long enough so that we have a real experience of it. Also, because simultaneous with the delightful sensation arises joy, inner joy, sukha. And although at that time the body feeling predominates, because the body does predominate over the emotion, we have to be with it long enough so that the joy becomes established. It's impossible to have this delight within without having joy. It's a natural companion to it. There are five factors of first jhana, vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, and ekagata. Initial application, continued application, delightful sensation, joy, and one-pointedness. The first two, or the first three, are in succession. But the other three are within us together. We have to be one-pointed. And the joy is there, together with the delightful feeling. If we do it properly, which means that we don't deviate from the attention on that delightful sensation and stay with it for, let's say, something like 10 minutes. We don't look on the watch, of course, or the clock, but it's a solid chunk of time. The Buddhist instructions are to deliberately let go of that delightful feeling because we know that it's still gross and there must be something which is more subtle than that. We drop our attention on that delightful feeling and the whole attention goes to the emotion, to the joy. Emotion is a little more subtle, a little finer, a little more elevated than the physical feeling. Joy is the second jhana. Interestingly enough, many Westerners find that one particularly difficult. It is very strongly connected to loving-kindness and also it is strongly connected to 
being at ease with oneself. Inner joy is something that most Westerners have great difficulty with. We must never, when we do the jhanas, miss that one. It has a very particular job to do for us. The joy that we experience in the second jhana works against the, our fourth hindrance, restlessness and worry. And restlessness is, of course, something that only goes for the non-returner completely. But the more restlessness we have, the less happiness we have. So to experience inner joy and actually be able to stay with that not only has the um, ability to work against uh, as an antidote, but it has something else. When we come out of the jhana, first or second or any one of them, there are three things that need to be done. The first thing that needs to be done is to recapitulate how did I get in so that it becomes a habitual pathway. Now, obviously, if we've done it often enough, there's no need to recapitulate. We know. A person who has done the jhanas often enough sits down and does them. There's no need for the key. There's no need for the breath. And just sit down and do them. But if one is new at it, one needs to recapitulate. What made it possible this time? Why did it work? And one will find that everybody has a personal trigger. There's little things which can make a difference. One may have sat differently. One may have eaten or not eaten. One may have had a rest or not. One may have thought differently. Something that was helpful. It's very important to recapitulate because meditation should never, never be potluck. It's a pathway, the pathway of the mind. So that's the first thing we do when we come out of jhana. Second thing is, that too is impermanent. We can watch it dissolve. We can watch the delightful feeling dissolve because either the meditation time is over or the concentration is over. So that impermanence, to see that impermanence, is extremely important because we don't have any reluctance to see the importance of, uh, to see the impermanence of dukkha. But we have great reluctance to see the impermanence of sukha, of that what we like. So here, it's important to see that. And then there's a third step. And that step is not only to see the impermanence, because the mind can become pretty mechanical about that and say, oh, yes, imp impermanent, I know all that. What am I learning? What am I learning from this particular experience? Now, having gone across the threshold into one's interior being for the first time or maybe just a few times, one learns without a shadow of a doubt that there's something within one which one hadn't seen before, something which gives a home to the mind something which makes it possible for the mind to be comfortable without any outer condition. Nothing has to be right outside of us. It's got to be right inside of us. Obviously, we know that. I think anyway we do. But 
We've got to experience it. We've got to bite into the mango. And when we do, we have certainty. We have certainty that the meditation not only has brought about a change in consciousness, but also has brought about the experience of an interior being within us which is totally different from our everyday consciousness. Our everyday consciousness is well known to everybody and it's not satisfactory. It's duality. I like it, I don't like it, I'm going to have it, I'm not going to have it, it's yours, it's mine, it's theirs, it uh, it can be done, it can't be done. It's actually less than satisfactory, it's dukkha. But that, what we experience when we go inside, has a totally different ambience about it. We know there is something there within us which we've been looking for. And obviously the mind is joyful. It's a comfort, it's a home, and it has a residual effect, even though it's impermanent. It has a residual effect in our day-to-day living. We know we can get back there. We know that we can have that comfort for the mind again. And we know that not only can we have the comfort, but we can have that ability to expand the mind. That happens after the first jhana, after the second one, the inner joy, which we have to hang on to also for at least 15 minutes or so, we realize that That's what we've been looking for through our senses. And we realize that we don't need the senses for that. Which doesn't mean we're not going to have pleasant sense contacts. We certainly will because every human being has pleasant and unpleasant sense contacts. We can't live without them. But it means that they no longer have any priority in our lives. Guarding the senses. Guarding the senses is one of the injunctions, particularly for monks and nuns. And if it is repressive, it doesn't work. We see that over and over again. It's no use repressing. What we need to do is substitute. That inner joy has a different quality from the pleasure of the senses. It is, uh, first of all, of course, it's independent of outer triggers. It's only dependent upon concentration, which is very important, because that independence gives us a certain amount of freedom. But it also has a sweet quality has a sweetness to it. And it also has a quality of opening the heart. It's very often connected to loving-kindness meditation, which can be a very valuable access to jhana. If one is very good at that, if one is able to have good feeling, a really strong feeling of metta, it can be a very good um, entry. The breath can be, anything that we use can be an entry. Having experienced the joy and having understood through recapitulation after the jhana, how did I get in? What did I do? What have I learned from it? The mind is very much at ease. Now this recapitulation and this um, 
finding out what I've learned is best done when we come out completely out of the jhanas. If we continue from the first onward, it's best done at the very end. Otherwise, we're interrupting the concentration. Now again, the Buddha's instructions are the joy is still gross. There must be something more subtle. And so one lets go of that inner joy. Sometimes people find that a bit difficult because now they've finally got this joy. Now they want to keep it. But if one knows the instructions, one knows that there's more to come. Having been able to let go of the joy, the mind goes into a state of contentment. And it's quite an obvious state. All these states of the mind are not diffuse, not difficult to recognize. They are quite obvious states of mind. That state of contentment comes about because we've had what we wanted. We've had joy. This contentment has a f- goes into a feeling of peacefulness. Now the first two, the um, first and second jhana, the delightful sensation and the joy, are both somewhat exciting. And one does get a feeling as if they're happening sort of on the level of the heart or the level of the head. These are just imaginary things, of course, because they have a certain excitement about them and haven't dropped deeply. When we get to the third one, the contentment, which brings that peacefulness about, one does have a feeling of having dropped into a deeper state. And these are just uh, feelings. The mind gets more solidified getting into this third one. This is a very important insight, jhana, because one realizes after one comes out that contentment is only possible if there are no wishes. That particular time for the third jhana is wishless. We've had joy. We want nothing else. There's contentment. Knowing that, that contentment is only possible without any wishes, what we're doing is we are affirming the first and second noble truth through personal experience. The jhanas are the means. The inside is the goal. And there's no reason for anyone not to gain these insights because they're so obvious. In fact, they are, one could say, almost automatic because the mind is quiet and peaceful, calm, not bothered, like a pond where there's no ripple. If there's no ripple in the water, we can look to its depth. We can look to the deepest depth of that pond. But as long as it ripples, as long as there are waves, all we're going to see are the waves. Now the waves are, of course, our thoughts and our emotions. And with them, we won't see into depth. So here, having the third absorption, we can also say that once we have passed the threshold into the first one, it's not difficult to go to second and third. From experience of many students, Whoever gets first, gets second and third. Fourth is a little more difficult. 
One of the prerequisites for any meditation, particularly, of course, jhana meditation, is giving oneself wholeheartedly to the task at hand. I must have said that sentence hundreds of times already. If one can't give oneself up, if one can't give in, if one can't let go, one keeps on thinking. One keeps on experiencing whatever it is that's happening. But if one is able to let this person go at least momentarily, well, these are just similes and are not meaningful if that's not the way one feels about it, but it is the peacefulness. This is a very important inside possibility. Namely, that when we come out of that, we realize that utter peace is only possible when me has been laid aside. And it's such a relief that one can say that fourth jhana gives one a taste of what path and fruit's all about. It's at least one gets an inkling. All of them make the mind pliable, flexible, expansive, give the mind that ability which we need in order to see and experience absolute reality. I've already talked for an hour. Do you want to hear about the formless jhanas also, or, or do you just want to hear the first four? Okay. The first four are called the Rupa Jhanas. Rupa, as you know, is actually matter, body, materiality. But they are translated as the fine material jhanas, fine material meditative absorptions. Quite a mouthful in English. The reason for their name is that we do know states like that in our ordinary life caused by outer triggers and of far less quality than what we get in the jhanas. But we do know delightful sensation. We do know joy. We also know momentary contentment and the depth of peace that we experience in the force would probably not be available to anyone in ordinary life, but we do know peacefulness. So there is a certain connection and therefore, they're easily recognized. And also, the Buddha did explain them. Maybe not at such length, but he did explain them. Whereas, when we come to the Arupa Janus, the formless Janus, all he really did was give them names. With those names, we have an indication. In some suttas there is some explanation about them. In the Visuddhimagga there is a little more explanation about them. The fourth jhana is very often where the sutta stops. It doesn't go into the formless. However, it is also said that the fourth one is, so to say, the um, necessary requirement in order to go into the formless ones. But it happens, actually, not infrequently, that people go from the third to the fifth and miss out on the fourth. And that's all right, too, because eventually one can come back to it. 
between each jhana, the Buddha recommended that we deliberately let go of that what we are experiencing in order to go a step higher. Because we know that there must be something which is more subtle and even more satisfying. Now, having gone into fourth jhana gives a feeling, as I said, as if we land at the bottom of a well. It may be as we land under an ocean wave. It may have nothing like that. But it's into depth. It certainly feels for everybody as if it, the mind is going down into depth. Now, fifth jhana is a different feeling altogether. It has a feeling as if the mind goes upward and outward. And the Buddha explained in one sutta that one, in order to experience fifth jhana, which is the infinity of space, one can actually start at the outline of one's own body, which is diffuse at that time, but it's still available, go further to the limits of the building, the limits of the place where one is, past the villages and forests, up to the sky, past the horizon, into limitless space. One may not need that. Having been able to do the first four, one may be able to let the mind just go upward and outward and experience the infinity of space. The infinity of space is, of course, much more difficult to describe because we don't have that in our everyday experience. While the mind is in it, it isn't concerned with anything. It's infinite. When one comes out of it, one realizes that within all materiality, and space is materiality, there is nothing which is, has a boundary, which has a limit. In other words, no personal identity. There isn't anybody in there. There is materiality, infinity of space, but within it, nothing can be found that has any sign, that has any form, nothing at all. Now, obviously, that's a very helpful experience. While we may know all that, we need to experience it. And again, anyone who has, gets into first jhana and is a diligent meditator, should have no problem getting to fifths. Step by step, slowly, one after the other. Fifths and sixths are intrinsically connected. Just like in the first jhana, simultaneous with delightful sensation, joy arises because it's not possible any other way, Simultaneously with infinity of space, the infinity of consciousness arises. Because only infinity of consciousness can become aware of any kind of infinity. So what actually happens when we want to let go of fifths in order to go to sixths? We let go of that feeling of that realization of unbounded space and again can start out with our own consciousness. Wherever we think our own consciousness is, we go to that and start expanding. And again, expand and expand and expand until the consciousness becomes infinite. And again, we realize there's nobody in it. There's just consciousness. This is the experience which in the um, Hindu tradition is often 
mentioned as Tatvamasi. I'm that. Because I'm that or that is me. There's no me. But the one who's experiencing that realizes it's absolute infinity. It's not enlightenment. But it certainly helps one to get a taste of what the Buddha talked about. And it certainly helps one to have some vega, urgency to practice, urgency to get to path and fruit. Because the realization of infinity of space and infinity of consciousness makes it so obvious that if we think of ourselves as a person, the delusion is rampant. We know it's delusion, but the experience of it has to be there. The experience of that delusion is a real important milestone because that experience of that delusion helps one even when there hasn't been path and fruit because we can always remember what it was like when we experienced the infinity of space and the infinity of consciousness. Um, We can bring up that feeling again, even in a daily situation, and remember, there wasn't anybody there. There just is mind and matter. Space is matter, and consciousness is mind. The infinity of that means an enormous expansion of the reaches of the mind. It doesn't mean that we all of a sudden know everything. But it does mean that we have a totally different horizon. We don't see ourselves as the center of the universe. Usually when I say that, people think, no, they don't see themselves as the center of the universe. Well, it needs to be tried out. We see ourselves totally different after that. We see that there is nothing but mind and matter. And again, I'd like to mention they are mundane states. They are not super mundane, but they bring us to that ability to have super mundane states. The next one after that is the base of nothingness. And mighty little is said about it in any of the suttas. What actually happens is that the mind, having experienced the infinity of space and the infinity of consciousness, looks at that and realizes that there's nothing in it of any sign, any form, only movement. And that is that movement which is the particles coming together and falling apart which the mind can then afterwards explain but as it experiences it this movement there's nothing but this very fine subtle constant movement which is in everything in all mind and all matter And again, at that time, when the base of nothingness is experienced, the mind is still concerned and still connected to the infinity of space and consciousness. So sees in it that there's nothing other than this movement to be found. That's the greatest insight into impermanence that one can get. There's nothing there that's solid. Absolutely nothing solid can be found. Now, obviously, these are Rupa Jhanas, the formless Jhanas, bring depth of insight. And one can hardly avoid those insights. When one experiences these things, it is... uh, 
seemingly impossible to avoid these insights. And they are sometimes called the Vipassana Janus, particularly 5, 6, and 7. The eighth one is a very peculiar one, a very particular one. It has a certain similarity to the force because it's very peaceful, but it's not totally clear. It's called neither perception nor non-perception. In other words, the mind goes into a state of utter peacefulness, but does not register the peacefulness. So it doesn't bring insight, the eighth one but it brings enormous mental energy. Now, this is another point which should be remembered, that the only way the mind gains sufficient energy in order to do the job of letting go of delusion, it really needs the peace and quiet of total absorption. That's where it gains its energy from. That's where it rejuvenates. That's where it finds the impetus. A jhana meditator cannot lose the impetus for the path if such a person continues to meditate. I think maybe I have said enough about the jhanas and I would like to invite you to uh, discuss, if you like. It seems that Fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh are the most common ones for path moments, but that doesn't rule the others out. Not at all. Any of the others are also possible. The path moment has a relationship to a jhanic state, but it also has an enormous difference. In all jhanas, we have an observer. In the past moment, we don't. And that's the enormous difference. The instructions which we find over and over again are like this, that after having come out let's say, fourth jhana, just for, to use one of them, that the mind is imbued with the fact that only if one lets go of the delusion of self can there be peace. And since one wants utter peace, one wants to let go of delusion of self. Now that's a prerequisite that one wants to determination, there's an aditana, one makes a resolution, I want to let go. Now, letting go of that, one needs to recognize the fact that we have identifications. And if we have already let go of some of those, it may be a quick process. If it isn't, we need to let go of each identification that we have. I'm a monk, I'm a nun, I'm male, I'm female, I'm a meditator, I'm a jhana meditator, I'm a good meditator, I'm a nice person, I'm a not a nice person, whatever it is. Letting go of every identification that we can find. Having done that, and having that really strong, 
determination to let go of the delusion and the mind at that time being not only malleable, flexible and expansive, but being totally quiet and having no connection to worldly matters at that time. Then, becoming quite aware of the fact that in order to get rid of that illusion, one has to let go of all clinging. Clinging to anything at all. And the mind will have to experience at least a moment of what is usually called non-occurrence. I call it the still point. The mind will have to experience a moment where nothing at all happens. Now, being determined to let go of all clinging and sort of clearing out the space in one's mind, letting it all fall away. Then one can send the mind out, like I like to compare that to a carrier pigeon, send it out to experience total stillness. If one has let go of clinging, it will do it. If not, it won't do it. The path moment, having no observer, cannot be described. The fruit moment has the observer. And the fruit moment is practically the same for everyone. It's um, a very distinctive happening, and no, uh, whoever has had it will never forget it. And it's, uh, it has a very distinct and um, obvious emotions in it. One of the strongest emotions of the fruit moment is relief, absolute relief. That's a very, very strong one. There are other emotions also, but that is a strong one, a feeling as if a burden has been lifted. Having had one fruit moment, Path moments cannot be repeated. Fruit moment should be brought up again in one's recollection after jhana because that brings one to the next one. It's a very brief account of what you were asking me. is uh, wrongly translated in the Buddhist dictionary and um, it's uh, translated if I remember correctly as discursive thought and um, what's the next one translated as continuous discursive thought or something like that Vitaka is initial application to the meditation subject and happens in every meditation it doesn't matter whether it's a jhana or not if you put your mind on the breath that's vitaka and vichara is continued application and it's compared to ringing a gong you hit the gong that's vitaka and it clings afterwards and that's vichara staying on the meditation subject now in the jhana the initial application in the first jhana goes to the delightful sensation and then it stays with it. These are the two that we drop for the second jhana because we don't need an initial application because we have already had that and the continued application is already assured if we are doing the work properly. If not, we might have to start over again. They are unfortunately wrongly translated but... Um, 
It's not the only thing that's wrongly translated. So um, experience helps. Initial and continued application to the meditation subject. And initial application, the vitaka, is the antidote for our third hindrance, sloth and torpor. Logically, obviously, we time put our mind on the meditation subject, the mind cannot be lazy. And vichara, continued application, is our antidote against skeptical doubt. Because we gain a lot of confidence when the meditation works properly. I believe, and that's a personal opinion again, <laughs> I believe that the greatest obstacle is that they're not being taught. And then when they are being taught, which is rare enough, uh, what I've heard uh, is not exactly uh, the way the jhanas work. But that's only hearsay. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I wasn't taught them. There was nobody anywhere around that had any knowledge of them. In fact, I remember my experience of the first jhana very vividly. I went to the person who was then my teacher and told about it. And he said, go back to the breath. And I knew that couldn't be right. I was old enough to know that he didn't know. So I continued. So I didn't have a teacher, but I found Venomanana Rama to confirm it. And uh, I believe that uh, the greatest obstacle is that they're not being taught. I've had students, lay people, mind you, um, who had done these jhanas spontaneously, years and years ago, and had looked all over the place trying to find somebody to explain it to them and couldn't find anybody. And then when they were explained, they could do them really well. I mean, had done one or two of them. The, um, I think that's the greatest obstacle from my experience. You're perfectly um, welcome uh, to argue with me. I have absolutely no uh, um, uh, worries or fear if you would like to say something against what I've been saying. I'm quite used to it. What I think about the teaching? Is there any relationship between those levels and the jhanas? What, what he's saying? Yes. Well, it's hearsay, what I know. I've, I've just been told by some one person, all right, by two, three persons, who went over there, and one described something, what was it, vertical, and I said, well, I'm afraid that's got nothing to do with nothing. And the others were already convinced that it wasn't correct. So I, I can't really, you know, I'm, I don't have the personal experience of what he's saying and doing. So I'm a little bit at sea. I, I can't really say it. Because, I, I mean, if somebody would, this one person was talking about something vertical. Well, I mean, what's vertical about it? You know, their the first they're, they're emotions, their inner states, the um, not all of them. So I'm, I'm I'm hard put to really compare. I can't. I 
I knew the man when he was still a retired police president before he was a monk and we never discussed anything. <laughs> hmm? 